Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Obi Novoso, the CEO of and co-founder of CoinFloor. Um, really big fan of CoinFloor by now because uh, I really understand and identify, you know, the philosophy, the ethos, because um, it's a Bitcoin only product and project and company. So, um, yeah, uh, Obi is um, CEO and co-founder, and he's got 20 years of experience in, uh, you know, the technologies um, in this space for over 20 years. So I want to have his take, you know, on, on uh, also, on a, you know, a range of other topics such as merchant adoption, what he thinks about, you know, the, uh, the unfolding of the, of the economical monetary crisis, um, out to DCA, uh, and yeah, a spectrum of other fascinating topics I want to talk to him about. So without further ado, this is my uh, interview, my talk with Obi Nabosu. Uh, let me know what you think, your feedback, your questions, and thank you so much for support and for listening. Hey, Obi. Hey. How are you doing? Thanks so much uh, for your time and good. thanks so much for coming to my show. No problem. How are you? I'm great. Uh, Obi, could you just, uh, for my, uh, especially for my listeners who haven't maybe uh, heard, um, you know, haven't heard anything from CoinFloor um, or about yourself, like a little bit about your background? Yeah, so um, I was um, born and bred Londoner, Nigerian parents, I like to call myself an anglo Um <laughs> And... <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, conceived in Nigeria, but born in England. And I've been living in England most of my life, other than a stint living in India. Um, but other than that, I, I, I lived in England all my life. And um, I, my background was a technologist, uh, a card-carrying geek. So I hold my hand up. I studied computer science and cognitive science, so AI, before it was really called AI in university. Um, was involved in dot-com one. In the in UK and Europe, dot com two with social media and and massively multiplayer virtual gaming, um, and virtual currencies actually came about then. This was ten plus years ago, and then finally I struck out myself and set up my own company. And this is my this is my third company. First one was sold. The second one um, learned a lot, but lost a lot of money. And then um, finally I came came to Bitcoin. Um, yeah, in the background of CoinFloor, we, we, first of all, Bitcoin, I first came across Bitcoin in 2011. As, as a techie, a lot of people were talking about it um, in, in tech circles, and it was really technically interesting. But after it dropped from, you know, nearly $100 to $10, $20, I thought, oh, this is a waste of time and I'll, I'll leave it. Um, and I came back to it in 2013 when um, my co-founder, um, well, soon to be co-founder, approached me with the idea of setting up an exchange in the UK. Um, I looked at the price, it was now in the several hundreds. And I realized that not only was it technically interesting, but it had this economic and social underpinning that I didn't see two years earlier. And I realized that this was something that was going to be very significant um, and it made sense to just create an exchange that had free tenants, trust, reliability, and security. And that's what we've maintained ever since. We've, there's multiple ways you've done that. And it's been a, a, a tumultuous, exciting road over the last six and a half years now. Um, um, but, but I wouldn't, wouldn't change it for anything. You know, it's funny because when you hear, uh, when I hear uh, those stories about like prominent Bitcoiners who, who got in touch for the first time with Bitcoin, they brushed it off, right? So a lot almost of Almost everyone does. Almost right? everyone does. Yeah. Like when was the first time you understood, because you, you, you talked about like economical, social, many, may, yeah. maybe even yeah. monetary properties. When was it like aha moment where it's like, oh my God, that's like absolute scarcity. You know, it's immutable, whatever, you know, like all these yeah. monetary properties. That's an amazing question. Um, so literally a couple of days ago, I was talking to a, a VC friend of mine who was telling me back in 2011, um, I, I, when I first came across Bitcoin, I was waxing lyrical about it and I was just infatuated with this technology. But it was purely from a technical point of view. And 
it wasn't until probably it was probably about a year into about two by about mid 2014 that I really started to and and, to, and through 2015 I really started to understand that fundamentally the technology and all of these stuff were foundations but they were foundations to support a greater concept which was a philosophy you know it's a it's sort of monetary re-education as I like to call it um, and the philosophy is that actually um, people talk about existing crypto existing fiat currencies as being stable and so on but what really people want is certainty and bitcoin provides a level of certainty that you have never seen before we know what's going to happen to bitcoin over the next 140 plus years um, there are some question marks but compared to the question marks of a fiat currency which by design it, you, you're supposed to not know what's going to happen. You have to wait on bated breath every time the central bankers decide what they're going to do to interest rates or, or inflation levels, etc. Where with, with Bitcoin, you know what's going to happen. And that certainty is this amazing, provides an amazing umbrella. You know, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the first one is physiological needs and the needs for safety and security. Well, Bitcoin, from a monetary point of view, provides that need in terms of security and safety and understanding and certainty of your money to a level that we haven't seen before. And once you understand that, that allows you to have the confidence to go off and build a, a completely new financial future based on that. And you realize that everything else you do in terms of the technology and so on is just to ensure that certainty and make it ever more certain. So adding fungibility, adding reliability and so on, all are, should be um, at the altar of making it ever more certain. Scalability is great, but if it is at the risk of certainty, it's a no. And then everything else sort of fits into, into, into place after that. When you interact with people around you, like, uh, I mean, you know, I've been talking with my girlfriend about, because she's saying, you know, we should really go more outside of this echo chamber of Bitcoin because, you know, we're all Bitcoiners, you know, on Twitter and we're all in this echo chamber, but let's like, you know, massive, you know, loads of people out there who, yeah, might have heard, you know, one, once or twice about Bitcoin, but they haven't really got in touch. They don't know, they haven't really felt to experience the pain point. They don't understand, you know, the monetary properties or that yeah. it's a savings technology how do they how do you communicate with these people how do you what's the first like what is like you know there's like so many you know triggers oh, we're trying we're trying we're thinking about it well first of all if you think about everybody goes to this journey um where you finally the light bulb moment happens or you're going through that process and it's, it's a gradual thing it's a sort of slow illumination as opposed to a light bulb some like dimmer switch getting lighter and lighter um and as that happens, you start to talk to friends about it. And you eventually get labeled that, that Bitcoin guy, you know. And, you know, everybody everybody knows this experience. They're in their group of friends, you're the person, whether it's spoken, unspoken or not, who just is always is going to be to turn the conversation towards Bitcoin. If we're talking about kitten photos, it's going to be somehow there's going to be a link to Bitcoin at some point. And... Um, uh, and what you notice is that most people initially, just like most of the people who entered Bitcoin, rail against that eventually. They, they want to just talk about day-to-day -day life and they feel it's very separated from them. I think what we've come to realize is that there are two ways to get to them. One is, uh, but ultimately people have to come towards Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is almost like this sort of black hole, this gravitational well. And people come towards it and there's people who are closer to it who are more inquisitive and people who are further away so they'll take longer to get into it sort of it's event horizon where there's no escape to, like, sort to of, when the, like sort of once the student is ready the master will come right <laughs> yes yeah, so, so they, they have to sort of come towards it to some some degree and our job is not to try and drag them towards it because that's sort of inevitable other things happening in the world will cause them to sort of seek certainty because as i say maslow's hierarchy of needs we want security and safety it's it's built above the only thing that's more fundamental is the need for water and air and so on but after that you want certainty and reliability and bitcoin 
the more you understand it, the more you see it's being consistent and every 10 minutes blocks are coming out and so on, um, the more we will realize that this is an incredibly certain technology, a monetary technology, and they will be drawn towards it. So our job is to do um, two things, really. There are a number of false, so now I'm stretching the metaphor here, but a number of false um, black holes circling around it. Um, and these are altcoins, some people call them. Some of them are called shitcoins, but it doesn't really matter. These are sort of false black holes and or force maxima in terms of optimization and the risk that customers or, or potential new converts to bitcoin have is that they will fall into these false maximas and these false black holes and not reach the, the main one and once you're in and you've invested money and time and effort and and your own personal brand it's very hard to come out of that into into the correct one because you have to sort of it's, it's a very hard psychological thing to do. So I now see our job more, um, less about trying to get people to come towards um, Bitcoin and more about to, preventing them to, to sort of, uh, preventing them from going to the sort of false maximums. Um, and so that's why we focus on, um, you know, monetary re-education, but it's also buy Bitcoins, not coin BS. Because there's a lot of altcoin BS out there, a lot of shitcoin BS out there. And, um, and so that's why we want to, to, to make sure it's very clear. Um, and the big, big, big um, people who have a big um, responsibility for towards this are exchanges. And, and, we, and we could talk about that more, but they're the first point. And the big problem right you have right now is that multiple exchanges offer a plethora of options without highlighting that one is literally over at this point in time at 67 point X percent dominance the market cap of bitcoin is more than twice the market cap of every other coin combined but so but if they're quoted on the same page with similar with similar presence a new user won't realize that you're comparing a uh, uh, a tommy toy of a spaceship with the spacex bfr rocket compared to each other you won't realize that they're completely separate things yeah yeah, totally. I totally agree. And you know what the thing is, I'm uh, I'm not gonna name the, the exchange. You're probably gonna know that it's one of the one of the prominent ones with the lowest with one of the lowest transaction fees. And you know they're top notch security service, all that. But um, a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, they have criticized why are they still shilling, you know, all the why is this, why is there so much distraction with shit coins? And that's why you know I can identify with your ethos and philosophy uh, on uh, also on on Twitter. <laughs> where you say, where's that, um, where you say, a coin floor lets anyone invest and hold Bitcoin easily and safely. Born in 2013, our passion is providing Bitcoin services minus the crypto industry bullshit. And that's like really sweet for me because I can identify with the ethos. And yeah. I wish other platforms or products or whatever projects, companies would do that as well. Yeah, beyond, beyond um, coin floor, um, this is something that we think is important across the industry. I mean, we're a commercial company, we want to succeed, but our driving mission is to get to now is to get to guide people towards Bitcoin and avoid the BS. Mm -hmm. And, and we would feel incredibly happy if um, we managed to succeed in getting more and more exchanges to go Bitcoin only. And I actually predict, that this epoch will see the return back to Bitcoin. We announced that we were going Bitcoin only. It was a hard decision to make because the whole industry is going to multiple cryptos. Um, and a lot of users say, I want more cryptos, even though we know they, that, that they don't trade very high volume. But we just didn't like the fact that there was a misalignment of, of, of incentives. Most exchanges do not, in their own treasuries, because they might hold their own bit, um, crypto, will not touch anything other than Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum. Some will maybe hold Ethereum. But the, the, the vast majority of coins they list, they will not touch. And so if you're not willing to eat your own dog food, as Google would say, that seems disingenuous to offer it to your customers. Now, the argument is customers want choice. But, you know, someone coming in new, even if I'm an award-winning, I always like to give the example, if I'm an award-winning maxiofacial plastic surgeon, you know, one of the most difficult uh, medical um, qualifications to get. If I go into Bitcoin, I'm a baby. 
you know, um, skill doesn't translate that way. Or, or also, if I try to ride a, a motorbike, I'm going to be a beginner as well. It, it, it's, it's, it's no, there's the assumption that because you're really good at one skill, you're going to be good at another is, is ridiculous. We know that's not the case. So when they come into, someone comes into Bitcoin, you have to understand that they're literally a um, neo-money um, child. They're, they're, they're day one. And if, if you ask a child, well, in a sweet shop or what do you want to eat? They're going to say, I want everything and, until the point they get sick. You know, so they're going to ask for multiple choice. But as an, as, an, as an adult, someone who knows this space, you'll know that actually it's not good to just offer them whatever they want, you know? Um, and at some point, instead, what you should offer them is what, what they need at the beginning, plus lots of education. And once they have enough education, then offer them whatever they want. And if they, because at that point, they will very likely not want anything other than the, the things that are best for them anyway, after being educated. But to offer them in the, in the interim is, is, is disingenuous. And you know, it's just a mechanism to earn money from them. But it's, but it's not a mechanism to have them for, do the thing that's best for, them, for themselves. Yeah. Um, as you know, as, as the events are now um, unfolding, you know, and with an exponential speed, you know, the economical crisis, I mean, economic crisis, we are in the midst of a depression. I mean, if we just look at the United States, the, you know, unemployment numbers, businesses just, just literally devastated. Um, do you, do you experience, do you get more like uh, immediate feedback from people or more direct questions in regards to their, you know, to, to the economy, to their income, to their savings? Is that like something you, you, you know, you experience more? So um, we're not getting direct feedback in terms of um, the economy and savings, but we are, we, um, you know, personally and as a, as a company, we engage with the, the Twitter conversation and that is an, a growing theme. I think um, it's the, the catalyst, this was a long time coming. We've known, I mean, in fact, we expected it to come at two, in 2009, which led to the, the, to the birth of, uh, of Bitcoin. And, um, and it didn't happen then. Money printing managed to, to delay the process. But um, it was still fundamentally the system was, was, hadn't fully recovered and it was likely this was going to happen again. It was just waiting for a catalyst. And that catalyst came in the form of, the, you know the the king the king um, virus the, the coronavirus and that's effectively if you look at it and its effect on the world is a form of viral nuclear bomb you know it's it's even corona crown almost like the crown of a of a plume of a bomb um and the world is fighting it um it's a very unusual war because the the, the soldiers are doctors and nurses and, and, and primary care workers. Um, and it attacks the oldest as opposed to the, the youngest, but it's still a world war um, in all respects in terms of the, the, the world's response to it. Um, but what, just like our expectations for a uh, thermonuclear war, the actual explosion itself is just the beginning of the story. It's the fallout, which has the far bigger, far more far reaching effect that can go on for years. And the fallout for um, that we see, and you see the discussion happening a lot um, and realization increasing is obviously there's a the money printing is the obvious thing, you know, BRR dot money and all this sort of stuff and um, is, is, is clear to see. But what is not so clear, and I think people are starting to realize is the widespread remote working. And that's going to be, and, and a lot of people are talking about that concept, how that's going to have this significant and foundational um, and fundamental effect on how people interact. Um, and what's really interesting about it, like unlike the other two, you, a vaccine, a cure for the vaccine will very likely be found at some point, or we'll adapt and we'll figure out how to live with, with um, this as a, um, as a, as a um, endemic um, virus that never goes. And in terms of the money printing, we've seen that there's almost no limits to how much money can be printed. There are no limits, really. So, so money printing will continue. The, um, but once people's mindsets have changed, once they are now used to the concept of, not all, but a significant percentage use of the concept of 
working remotely, that has a fundamental um, 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 effect on reducing demand for commercial real estate, for airline flights, um, and for all of the businesses that support that. So for example, transit, um, for going back to work, all of the businesses around that. And so, and that will lead to a fundamental depression in the economy. Um, now, how do you hedge against that? Well, I, stocks and sh if you think about it, for the average person in the street, there were four things they put their money in. They would um, put their money into um, real estate. It's number one thing. If I want to hold the value of my money, real estate. Two would be, um, I'd put it into stocks and shares. Three, I'd put it into cash. And four, maybe, maybe they consider putting it into gold. This is for the average. Most people wouldn't get onto, you know, fine wines and, um, you know, and um, art, etc. cetera. Um, now, if you look at those cash, we've always known that cash was not actually a good in, a place to hold your value. And now in a world of money printing, it's going to be just more obvious. Most people start to realize this is not a good place to hold your value. Stocks and shares, well, if your remote working will lead to a fundamental reduction in, in demand for, for many businesses, it will, it will increase some, but on average, more will be reduced than will increase. So even though there's money printing will lead to this sort of artificial pump in prices, eventually the market will move to the fundamentals and that means that the, the, the outlook is not going to be so good for stocks and shares, um, <coughs> stocks and shares for the, for the coming few years. Real estate as well, with, with significant use of remote working, all of a sudden, um, commercial real estate, which is a big part of the property market, and also lots of expensive real estate, um, retail real estate, um, per, uh, which is, is expensive because of, by virtue of the fact that it's with an easy commute of commercial real estate, the demand for all of those reduce. Because now I can now move and live where I'd like to live, which is comfortable and inexpensive, because I don't need to commute so frequently. So this again will have a negative effect on real estate prices. And in gold, could potentially do well, but Bitcoin comes into the, into the market as this digital gold, which is accessible by anybody. Um, and is clearly, to people in the space, is, is, is lining up to be a better gold than gold. Yeah, exactly. Um, you heard, um, you might have, uh, you heard probably the, about uh, this um, uh, macro investor, what's his name, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Yes. Do you yeah. think it, with his statement, uh, at least on the institutional level, that could accelerate the critical adoption rate? I mean, directly and indirectly have an effect like on the critical adoption rate? I mean, it's an interesting statement. I, 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 um, I retweeted it like a few others, but it is one statement of many it's and it will he it will convince some people i, I had um um people we know who were on the fence around bitcoin um or maybe could see some of its value but weren't sure about some other aspects they were um influenced by the fact that um paul tudor jones um decided to put i think it turned out to be about two percent about a billion dollars worth of his fund um into bitcoin so it will influence some people and um when um when other people in the past have decided to put capital into bitcoin it's influence it's influenced a few that's that's the sort of a, an example of this sort of gravitational force that is bitcoin so it's just someone else who's finally gone over the edge and decided to to go in um, uh, we're seeing banks starting to offer uh, banking as banking, for example, for an exchange was historically incredibly difficult. It's become easier. Um, you're seeing large institutions offering bank accounts to exchanges. Once that happens, it, others will open because if, if you're starting to see people like Goldman Sachs offering bank accounts, well, Barclays and HBC will look at that and say, okay, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Even JP um, Morgan. <laughs> yeah, even JP Morgan have a trading desk or so on. This it, it's so this is an inexorable thing. We could and, and if you're in the space, you see this was gonna happen. Um there will be people who will only realize it's happened after it's happened. We've got we've got the trophy, we've gone home, we've put it on the mantelpiece, and it's been running for five years, and then they'll finally realize, oh, Bitcoin is a thing now. Um and they'll be the they're the furthest away from the from the black hole. Um, so he's just happened to just go over the event horizon and put money in and he's putting in 2% and, 
And guess what? The next thing you know, he'll be increasing that to 5%. And it's, 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 it's just, the story just plays out again and again. We've seen it over six and a half years. Um, so it, it is good. And, but in a way, we're, as an exchange, um, we have this sort of weird sort of <laughs> um, almost um, counter reaction to it because there's so much stuff we want to do. And we also know that the halvings happen and that sort of fires in parallel that, that hit, that's like a, 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 a pulling of the firing trigger for, a, for the next sort of the beginning of the next bull run. You may not see it for another 12, 18, even 24 months because as the economy gets bigger, it takes longer to happen. But that's the sort of a starting line um, and, you, and, the, and the gun has been shot. All these things mean that down the line, it's going to get into crazy town like it's done before in both other bull runs. And if you're around at a bull run, you're running an exchange, it's really hard to fathom how crazy it gets during a very short period of time when you're in full bull run territory. And to the point of retail, they will come in en masse. The majority of retail comes in in a very short period of time. And then it subsides when the market stabilizes again. Um, and so what we're trying to do is build our Bitcoin arc effectively. Because when the flood comes, you, you don't want to be drowned by the flood. Um, and, it, in, and, and so when you see things like Peter Judah, um, is it Peter Judah Jones or Paul Judah Jones? I always forgot. Oh, so but when you see... Yeah, um, PTJ, um, um, or you you know that the halvings happened. It just lights a fire under our ass to have everything ready, as automated as possible, as scalable as possible, have all the features clearly uh, as ready and clearly communicate your value proposition before the FUD happens, because we don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen in three months' time. It can happen in two, uh, two years' time. And, uh, everything. And, and, our, and our real worry is that the bull run happens too early which is sort of a crazy worry because <laughs> it's like because um, if it does happen we we will still everybody does well in the bull run basically um but um what you want to but what we fear back from a philosophical point of view is that lots of people will come in and they will be directed towards the exchanges that are selling them multiple um alternative coins mm -hmm. <laughs> knowing that knowing full well that they're going to take all the money and convert it into Bitcoin and hold their money in Bitcoin or sometimes fiat if they want to hedge, but they, they won't be holding it in wibble coin or wobble coin. Absolutely not. And, and so either we want to have as many of them convert over to being Bitcoin only in a time, or we capture as much as possible. I mean, obviously we'd want, we're an exchange and we're a commercial business. We'd want as much business as we can, but, if we can't do that, I'd, I'd love to see as many exchanges as possible going Bitcoin only so that when this next eight months comes in, the maximum number of people possible get given a correct and honest and no BS starts to the space. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, where is where's CoinFly I mean, um, represented or, or, you know, from what countries or um, yep. jurisdictions? Can people? Yeah, I know. Very easy. Um, so we, we're a UK company and the majority of our business is in UK GBP. However, um, we are exchanged as both U GBP and Euro and customers can join up from around the world. There's certain countries that we exclude like US, US because of it's, it's quite mm -hmm. a complex country from a, from a tax and, uh, and, um, um, regulatory point of view um, so I'd say the majority is is UK and then the second group is is EU because of the proximity to the EU um, um, for our we've now recently launched a retail offering um, and we call that auto buy and again for retail we believe that not only should it be Bitcoin but you should only offer investing and I and regular recurring investing because even professional traders struggle to make small profits consistently in trading. So to expect someone who's um, you know coming into this new to um, and and offer them a trading offering, we think again is disingenuous. And and um, the idea for us is 
for you if you're the bitcoin guy or bitcoin gal and you and you've experienced that horrible feeling when you've fi finally people come to you and they don't try to no avoid you in the means but they come to you because they're interested in bitcoin you explain and then you suggest an exchange and then they go away come back a week later and said that they didn't buy bitcoin they bought wibble coin because mm -hmm. it's cheap or whatever mm -hmm. um, and you face palm we now have an option you can recommend coin floor knowing that there's only bitcoin there's going to be no risk of them off buying wibble coin or wobble coin and also we're only going to suggest them to invest recurring regular which you know over time is the safest way we're not going to try and get them to do leverage trading or buy sell download an app and constantly be checking the price because all of those things lead people if you're constantly checking the price and the price goes up and you don't have you don't have trader honed um, nerves of absolute steel mm -hmm. then you're going to overbuy when you shouldn't and you're going to oversell when you shouldn't so the best thing is to focus people on recurring automatic buying and then uh, maybe once a month, once every two months updates on how that's going, but not to track the price every few seconds. Um, then, you know, we have that option. In the US, you have people like Swan Bitcoin. You have in New Zealand, you have Vimba. You have Bull Bitcoin in, in, in um, Canada and more coming up doing that. But in the UK and soon in Europe, we're going to be out in Europe because, again, we announced and there's there's been demand for us to offer in Europe will be having the same feature. Yeah, there's, you know, a, a few uh, very strong Bitcoin advocates, you know, for advocating um, auto DCAs. I don't know whether you've, uh, you know, probably has McCook uh, from Bitcoin Twitter, it doesn't matter, but he's like really, he's, 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 he's sort of the number guy, you know, the engineer. And he said, you know, this is the only way to go out to DCA. So he's actually, the, the proof of isn't really is in the pudding. Right. So yeah. betting against the market or all this, you know, reading tea leaves, like technical analysis into Bitcoin, it's really uh, irritating, you know, and, and it, it's, it's a distraction and it's designed to get people to do things that are not in their interest. Every time you log into that site and you start to try and, you, and you're doing anything other than to try and learn. This is this. Is, so we have free products for retail um, and only one of them is actually a product to buy, but the other ones we consider products. So the first one is education. We consider that a product because, um, but we call it no BS education because we, because we have to re-educate people and, and, and that's actually a product. And part of that is doing as well, doing these talks, going on Twitter and coming out with more sort of blogs that are all about, um, about education. And so that's the first product. And before we, we purposefully, before we launched our um, buying product, we had the only product was the education product for a period of time to get people to understand the first thing you should do and what you should constantly be doing. As opposed to learning about trading is learning about Bitcoins, learning about the fundamentals of, of, of cryptocurrency and money. That's what you should be doing over the next one or two or three years. And that knowledge will protect you from selling when you shouldn't sell and buying, over buying when you shouldn't buy. As the first the second is not your keys not your coins you should once you have enough level of education experience and a balance that makes it worthwhile because if you've got 10 pounds it's probably not worthwhile you should custody yourself you should first get bitcoin get access to the community owning bitcoin is your visa into this new um new world um or your your um your um passport and then learning about um, um, self-custody and self-verification, trust but also verify is the next step because the, the mindset of the, building that sort of auditor type mindset. Then the next step is to be your own bank and that's to have your own wallet, ideally some sort of hardware wallet. And then the final, final step is to be your own central bank, which mm -hmm. is to have your own node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But doesn't make sense when you come in day one to go straight to being a central bank when you know nothing about money yeah. nothing about the fundamentals you have not you, you it's it's i think it's a bit too far a step but you should go through the education process and be focusing on it and then be driving the customer towards that process but there will be a period of time when they haven't if the the, the average hardware wallet right now is 50 maybe up to a hundred dollars about 50 to a hundred dollars for a hardware wallet um so it doesn't really make sense to have a $50, $100 wallet if you've only got 
$50 worth of Bitcoin or even $100 worth of Bitcoin. It's sort of the wallet itself is, is worth a third of your entire holdings of Bitcoin. It's better to have that 50 pounds in Bitcoin, you know, because <laughs> if that goes up 10x, it sort of becomes a very expensive wallet relative to your wealth. And so, but there's, so there will be a period of time where it, um, for an investor type, um, um, for a trader, you need to have money on exchanges to trade for liquidity. But for an investor, there will be a period of time where you're going to hold your money on exchange um, under a certain value. And for that period of time, you want to have a very strong um, or assurances around custody. Now, most exchanges right now are saying that the assurance, either they have none or the assurances are we use an external auditor and you should trust us because our, we trust because you should trust this auditor. That's wrong-headed thinking. That's, that's the old world thinking. We have something called proof of reserves, proof of custody, and we believe that the second product is using proof of reserves, proof of custody to prove your balances on regular schedule. Just yesterday, we announced, our, I think it was our 74th proof of solvency audit, which is now over six years of doing this. Um, and that is our mechanism to allow people to start the process of self-verifying so they can take the instructions and verify to some extent, no system's perfect, but to some extent that at a given point in time, we were solvent. And then, then they can wait for the next month while they're getting to the point where they've got enough education, enough confidence, and enough of a balance to then custody themselves. So if, if you're at the 5,000 level, you should, for example, in terms of value, you should almost definitely be having some as, uh, element of it custody yourself. If you're at the five pound or 10 pound or 20 pounds level, it probably doesn't make sense. And for that period of time in between, you should have assurances and start learning about self, mm -hmm. self verification. Um, and then the final product is the, is, is the auto buy offering, which is we believe that you should teach people to Bitcoin recurring payments. Cause we know that over time, not only is it, very it performs very well over time and it and it removes the emotion out of the the mm -hmm. buying process which is the main culprit for losing money the emotional side so this completely removes it but there's a more subtle point which is that the more people that um are um dollar cost averaging or stacking sats or originally called hodling but but in this very sort of um consistent way then the, uh, you can see that the more that will lead to the stability of the price because the price moves up and down because of, of short-term speculative behavior. If everybody was long-term long -term and not short-term speculative, then, then the price movements would be, well, it would still increase in price, right. but it'd be this, it would be this very, very smooth curve. I mean, they're very predictable. predictable. Yeah. Yes, because the more, just the more certain people are with their behavior, in line with the way bitcoin is if everybody was also like every 10 minutes a new block comes out every day a new consistent payment went in then people would understand that consistency and the price would be more consistent so if you want the price of bitcoin to be more consistent all the community should be telling people to become um um sat stackers um and uh, or dollar cost averages or or auto buyers as we like to call it the, and it's the simple decentralized solution to to the to the volatility problem. Fantastic. Um, what what do you um, would you say the some of the features? So for example, you know, you know, transaction costs. Uh, would that be like? Uh, is that a feature you 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 market to 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 you know to, to your potential uh, customers? You know, would you be in the range of average transaction costs compared to other? Platforms. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of our transaction costs, um, well, one thing we do is, um, first of all, we're very transparent to our costs. Mm -hmm. If you look um, for, um, for uh, there are two types of exchanges, ones that deal with more sophisticated users, which is what we had done historically up until the beginning of this year when we went into retail, um, and then ones that market to retail. And what you find is a tale of two story a tale of two transparency levels when you're dealing with sophisticated users who don't take any bs and and are, and are able to see through it all the sites will be very clear with their fees and they won't try to hide things because a sophisticated user will will just basically see it and 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 basically blackball them um and so they're very clear about their fees there 
when it comes to retail, the fees are incredibly unclear, opaque, uh, obfuscated, hidden, um, and and sometimes it, there, there's a, sometimes there isn't even a fees page. You have to go into support or terms and conditions and figure it all out. So the first thing we did is try to be incredibly clear. Now this is again a risk we're taking because if people make it look like all the fees are free or so on or, and they and they obfuscate it and then they have a little sort of asterisk look at the terms of conditions because it's free plus this big fee you know underneath uh, multiple things with small print um often a consumer won't see that and and get the assumption it's free uh, whereas with us we're trying to be transparent but we believe not being transparent is bs so and if we're saying no bs we have to be transparent in our fees so our fees are very transparent They're on the fees page However, um, we've looked at the average amount someone was going to do of an auto buy, and it's going to generally be in that sort of 20 to 100 um, um, pounds or euro sort of level. Because um, remember, they're doing this regularly and maybe start monthly and then they go to weekly. Uh, and what we prefer people do is instead of increasing the amount of an auto buy, increase the frequency of an auto buy to get to the same amount because that smooths it out more and it works out to be the same thing. So at that sort of 20 to 100 pound level, we are, we are very competitively priced. Um, once you sort of figure out, once you get your doctorate in mathematics and law and you figure out what the actual fees that the other people charge, then you can realize that, that we are, we are um, as well priced if not um, significantly cheaper in some cases, sometimes half the price. Some of these do at five, six, seven percent at certain fee points, but you have to sort of calculate it. It's not so easy to work that out um, when you when you look at it uh, prima face. It'd be very interesting to see if someone actually did took some of the the leading at least UK um, um, retail offerings and sort of figured out after deconstructing their fees what you'd actually pay if you're buying like forty quid's worth. And you'll find that the fees are far higher than you would have expected them to be. I love that aspect of transparency. Yeah. Um, because, it, you know, it also makes a whole a project, you know, more credible, just, you know, credible and, and authentic and, and, and genuine, you know. So I think it's really important, the narrative, like how do you, how do you communicate the narrative and, and behind it? Um, mm -hmm. say, uh, Obi, but to um, that point of, to that point yeah. of credible and transparent though, I mean, to be fair, the other way to appear credible in retail is just spend a lot of money on marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's something that we um, are not willing to do because, uh, and instead we, we want to try and offer a, a, just a transparent and honest, no BS offering. And hopefully our core strategy is that the, the, um, the Bitcoin maximalists, the people who really want to help bring this industry forward, recognize that and call out the BS and point people towards us. And so even though they may not, they may not want to use this retail offering, or, or they may want to use it as well, but they may want to use our more sophisticated offerings. That's not the point. Is that the, the point is that they should be aware of it so that they, so when someone's coming in new, they understand it's a journey and the first step should be pointing them towards a Bitcoin only exchange, which is an investment only offering. And the more of those that exist, like I say, the swans and, uh, and the bulls and, mm -hmm. and so on, um, the better. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing with, with me also, uh, I need to identify myself with the ethos, you know, and the, the product and then I can, you know, I can market it or market it. I mean, you know, or, or, or communicate it to, to, to the people around me. This is, you know, I, uh, let me, let me go to another point I was going to uh, bring up is I think, you know, uh, do you have like a demographics, like what kind of people that either are so like merchants, because I'm, I'm, my focus right now is to get more and more merchants, like small businesses, merchants, shop owners into the Bitcoin space, because, you know, I think this is the pulse of the time. This is the perfect timing to equip them, equip them, equip these merchants with an alternative opt in, you know, pay, a Bitcoin payment infrastructure, but it's, you know, it's not user friendly. And this is, I know I I'm sound like sometimes like a broken record, but I think it's so important to make it user friendly, to make it, you know, like, like really obvious, you know, from, from the thinking process. 
Mm. So I, I have a different view. We've looked at um, merchants in the past and so on. Um, and I think ultimately merchants will come in. But merchants tend to be furthest away on that spectrum of coming in because they need certainty more than other people. And, they, and, so, they, and so, they're, so they're just mindset-wise are n less willing to speculate with of products that in their time they perceive as less certain. So the key to get merchants in is not necessarily improving the technology, it's improving the certainty. And you improve the certainty by reducing the volatility. It could go up in value consistently, but as long as it's not like this and it's consistent, merchants are gonna be all over it. And so how do I improve the certainty? We, we in the past, which we, we did stuff in the sort of institutional space with physically delivered futures and so on. We launched that, it was, uh, and, and it and, um, did very well, and it's still doing well. But actually, at the retail space is to get as many people as possible, as many people as possible, um, auto buying, dollar cost averaging, sat stacking. Because if they're doing that, that stabilizes the price. And if they're stabilizing the price, and merchants feel that this is a very, very certain um, platform and technology, um, they will desire it. And if they desire it, they will jump over every hoop, every usability issue possible to use it. And uh, they will complain and, and demand feature usage. But even if it's difficult to use, if it's consistent and going up in value, every merchant will be falling over themselves to use it in its current form, even with the transaction issues, even with the usability issues on Lightning Network. And so, so you have to, um, you have to get the ordering right. You have to make owning Bitcoin desirable first. Mm -hmm. And then once it's desirable, people will want to own it as opposed to, and, and they would want to, and they'd want, and merchants will say, well, you know what? I'm willing to give you a discount if you give me Bitcoin, because I'm very confident that it will go up in value by 10% over the next year. So I'm willing to give you a discount of 10%. Mm. But if um, it's going like this, um, and, uh, and the more confident that I have in its, in, its, in its growth trajectory, the more I can sort of make a call that I'm willing to give you a discount so, cause, uh, cause to get it now to, because it's harder and harder to access and it's easier for me to access right now as a merchant. Um, as I say, the usability, if you look at um, other sort of disruptive technologies, in their first versions, they were very difficult to use. Yeah very clunky very unreliable but mm -hmm. there was a desire for it that was so much that people were willing to use this clunky difficult to use offering mm -hmm. and if that's so there are people who've uh, and so the people who want bitcoin right now and desire it are the people who have gone through the educational process and they understand it as a store of value um and they they've also understood that the short-term volatility is something that um, they can ignore because of the long-term fundamentals. The less the short-term volatility, the more people will be willing to make that mental leap because it's only the people who have spent a lot of time educating and they're the most risk tolerant are making that mental leap at the moment. It's very stable. Now, all of a sudden, you've got the full market. So to get merchants equals get everybody auto-buying, get, get everybody stacking sets, mm -hmm. get everybody... Um, dollar cost averaging. If you do that, merchants will be falling over themselves to come into this market. Yeah, it's really you... actually mm -hmm. store of value first, medium of exchange second. It was never even a question. It used to be a debate between Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin and Bitcoin, but it really is never a question. And the clue is in the name: which one's more valuable? Store of value is more value because it stores value. Right. No, uh, Obi, listen, I mean, I'm totally with you on the process of monetary evolution, you know, from store of value, medium exchange, unit account. But, you know, let me give you a concrete example. I mean, uh, to, to the point of user friendliness, I mean, it took me more than a week. And I'm not a techie guy, but I'm, you know, I would say I'm not inexperienced. And I sat down and turned my Casa 2 into a my node, full, you know, full node. And, yep. uh, you know, some of the applications are connected, you know, whether, whether it be Samurai Wallet. So I asked yep. my girlfriend, I said, hey, would you be willing to, you know, to, to 
equip yourself with a full node with all the infrastructure you know and you give your you give your and that's what exactly what you said before, previously you know you like uh, like what if the merchants you know uh, would uh, would offer their client their customers like five to ten percent whatever some kind of discount and she said yes yeah, she would love to but you know she doesn't have the time she literally works every day seven days a week in her business in her shop and but she would do she would offer that uh, as an alternative opt-in if people you know p most people are not interested they're ignorant about it they don't care they just want to you know pay anonymously or privately you know cash and you know buy the product and just you know and then and just 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 you know just just do the transaction so i'm like yeah i, I mean it's, it's difficulties but i said no it is like the final process that's a very quite advanced use case so you people first need to own Bitcoin, then understand about self-verification, then become have a hold their own own Bitcoin themselves and not on exchange, and then operate a node. Um, so that's it's going to be more complex becoming your own central bank, you know, because the equivalent is being your own central bank effectively. You're able to monitor the flow of money and um, and you're part of the process of verifying and allowing new money to be generated. In this decentralized way, in this decentralized way, um, so that's a pretty advanced thing. Uh, that's that's my first um, concern. My other view on that is that you have fiat money. Fiat money is inherently inflationary, yeah. and you have Bitcoin. And if you understand it, it's inherently disinflationary at, mo at the moment, and eventually will have zero, zero inflationary, <laughs> uh, uh, eventually zero inflationary, um, and maybe deflationary because some people unluckily will lose their Bitcoin and so on, leading it to be slightly deflationary. Now, if you have two monies, one that you expect to go up in value or hold its value, and the other one to go down in value, which one would you spend first as a consumer? what that is yeah so and when would and when would you when would you start spending this one when this one runs out right and when does fiat money that's printed by central banks run out never because it has an infinite supply yeah. so uh, i think that the only people who will use bitcoin are people who have no choice because just realistically you're going to use it um, you're, cause you, cause even if you just want to buy and then immediately buy something and immediately buy more Bitcoin, you've just given yourself a tax, um, um, a tax implication that you now have to, um, send off to, um, your various tax authorities at the, at the end of the year to buy a cup of coffee when you could have just bought it with fiat. And you also, you're going through two exchanges, crypto to, um, you're, you're transferring. So you've got a big, an on-chain transaction to transfer Bitcoin to someone and you're going to pay a fee for that in terms of minus fees um, and maybe lightning network fees and or lightning network fees and also you've got a transaction to convert more fiat into bitcoin you might as well have just sent them fiat right. so which which is going to be going down in value so you might as well send them that anyway um oh the only time people are going to use it to buy stuff is when it's something that they cannot buy anywhere else or in a way that they absolutely um, um, need over and above all of the loss of potential future value of Bitcoin. Um, so there are various sort of use cases that happen right now and some of them, you know, in the, but they tend to be edge cases. The mass market cases where you see it everywhere, I feel is an end game case where it's now, blindingly obvious to the majority of people including merchants who are just people that bitcoin is the ultimate store of value it's better gold than gold and it's clearly better for store as a store of value than um, real estate and so on and so forth that might take five years it might take 20 years it doesn't matter but at that point in time then you're going to see this wholesale move of merchants saying you know what i literally i'm i might take a discount or i will only accept bitcoin right um um, but if, if you've got 10 merchants and two or three only accept Bitcoin and seven accept fiat and Bitcoin, people will still use the seven that will accept fiat because they just want to get rid of the shitcoin, um, the real shitcoin, which is fiat, and, and keep Bitcoin. So it's only at the point when the majority of them, the people in your area, you have no choice, but all your merchants, and I'll say, I'm, I'm not touching anything other than Bitcoin, which will happen eventually. And then you'll see this switch over. And at that point, people will have to spend Bitcoin because there's no choice. 
and merchants will have to accept Bitcoin because because at that point they would they'd be crazy not to. But that's 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 quite far down the line, and um, and well before that is is a world where people are still using Bitcoin for its number one use case, which is a store of value, um, and. So that's why we focus people on store of value right now. It's a store of value. Bitcoin is already much easier to use, much more less expensive than any other option. You're talking about the complexity of setting up a node to own it, to, to, yeah, to, to then, own you know, it. But compare that to the complexity of buying a house. Yeah, and have a, like a... Like, compare that to the easy, complexity of buying a house. Yeah, yeah. And easy to it's use. It's far, you know, like, far uh, easier right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was going to ask you, like, because, um, I mean, that's why I'm looking forward to, to Strike, as I talked, um, talked a little bit to Rockstar Developer, and he said uh, Strike could come, hopefully, in the near future to Europe, to European Union, and that would really simplify uh, tremendously the process of, of payment because the, the, the customer doesn't even need to think about whether he's paying uh, in Bitcoin or fiat because the merchant at the end of the, of the transaction can just decide in what currency sort of, you know, uh, uh, the transaction can, should be or could be completed. So Strike, I think, yeah, I mean, could be a game changer in this. But that's I, I, I really hope it is. Um, and I really hope that, and I think that Strike and, and many other apps and out there are um, simplifying the process no end. And I, and I, I think you're going to see a, a massive simplification in, in terms of the, the payment process. Um, but I, I do still, I'm still having the assumption that most people um, for the foreseeable, especially if they're expecting the price of Bitcoin to go up significantly over the next two years, especially in this period of time, the next two or three years, will just look at it and just from an economic, um, if you believe in Bitcoin's fundamentals, if you don't believe in Bitcoin, you're not going to be using Bitcoin. And if you do, there's going to be a lot of, I, I don't see the incentive for you to spend it right now when you're expecting the price to go up. I, I, and what we've seen in the last bull run is that the volume was heavily weighted towards the buying and the only people who are selling are miners or, or traders. But the vast majority of people are, are trying to just buy. They, they, it's in terms of retail, it's getting into the market and a few people exiting. Um, but the reason why the price went up was because there was far more demand to buy than demand to sell. And so if you're thinking it's going to go up in price and you're speculating for the long term, um, you're, you're, you, I just feel like the likelihood that you're going to want to buy, even if it's really convenient. You have to understand the technical aspect and the speed of, of, and simplicity is not the main um, functional reason why people use fiat over Bitcoin. The main functional reason is actually an economic one, and that's what yeah. the realization is that one is inflationary, one is the one is the one is the, the the feature of inflation, which incentivizes getting rid of it. It's a hot potato, right. and one has disinflation and eventual zero inflation, which incentivizes holding on. So when you spend Bitcoin, you really have to think: Do I is this thing I'm buying worth 10x what it's what it's what 10x what it's what I'm spending on it now? You know, or do I need it so much that I'm willing to lose 10x on its future on it? Um, and there's a very few things that meet that test. Well, is this thing worse, worth more than I'm willing to spend on it right now? That's the question that you have to have in your mind when you're spending fiat. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just thinking in order to transition more into localism, circle economies, you know, and just even if it's just payments, transaction of a smallest fraction of a Bitcoin, like a couple yeah. of Satoshis, you know, this is what I'm getting at. Like, can we transition slowly into into a bit Bitcoin denominated circular economies uh, as, a, as a preparation, you know, for the for this new monetary economical evolution? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, the sort of the S curve where you, you, something starts and it slowly increases and it's this rapid expansion um, and then it slows down. Um, I think in the background, there's a huge amount of work happening on making the user experience simpler. There's work on like um, CASA to make these yes. um, nodes and others on sim simplified nodes, hardware wallets, you know, Ledger, Trezor, I've got, uh, and, and, uh, 
keep key. There's a few others that have, again have got easier and easier to use and um, also software wallets, green address wallet, um, Samurai wallet. with coin mixing, Samurai. coin joining. It's amazing. There's, it's there's, more there's, there's more, there's more, there's more and more that are coming. So work is happening in that space and that's building the foundations. But um, from my point of view, I don't expect them to be needed for a good few more years um, um, because we're still in this early stage of the S curve. And when it happens, like with most things, it's a bit like a revolution. It's like bubbling up, bubbling up the seeds and, and the foundations are, this is a, this is a monetary revolution. So, and, and if you analyze revolutions, it's just the seeds happen of, of sort of frustration and, and resentment build up slowly and the infrastructure for the new government builds up slowly. Um, so leaders of the revolution start to appear, they start to they have a greater and greater voice, they build up support. And when it reaches the critical mass, the actual process of the revolution happens over a week, you know? It's like government overthrown, so on, new party put in place. You don't, I mean, if you think about it logically, you, it's unlikely that um, um, if, if you had the revolution day one, when or without the infrastructure in place, you would have overthrown a government and it would have ended up in chaos. But what you tend to see happen is that this new organization, this new government comes into place and there are certain levels of structures that they have already thought out and it's already been in place. Now, the magic was, although it appeared to happen in a week, was a year or two or so before all of this was getting ready, one way or another was building up. And that's what's happening right now. But when it actually switches, it's literally going to be um, a very short period of time. People are going to yeah. finally, the, the, the penny's going to drop and, and there's going to be a switch. I still think there'll be a place for fiat currency because governments, the ability to print your own money is a superpower. And, and as long as people have to exist in countries and live there, there will be at least a requirement to pay taxes in the local currency for, uh, for at least the stronger economies. So there will be this requirement for fiat currency. And also, if it's inflationary, people will still want to get any fiat they earn, they will want to get, they will still, they'll, they'll, so I see it happening is um, where they can, they will spend their fiat. Otherwise they will try to convert it into Bitcoin um, and they'll, they'll convert it with people who need to get fiat to pay taxes as well. Um, and more and more people though, especially if they're, they're dealing with their work remotely, which is where again, remote working a standard where all your employees and customers could be anywhere in the world, that, that sort of, that trade, which is going to be, we already see is a bigger and bigger part of the world economy will be transacted in, in this sort of decentralized currency and stuff that you have to get locally. We have no choice because you, because you, you need it locally. will will probably, and in the physical world will likely be in fiat, et cetera, taxes and other stuff you have to get locally. And that will be a dividing line. If anything you have to buy locally, You'll, you'll convert your Bitcoin earnings or some subset into, into fiat to pay for those. Um, anything you need to get, anything else, which is all the stuff you buy online or get, to, then more and more you'd get that purchase in Bitcoin because only because the customers, only because your suppliers will not accept anything else other than Bitcoin. Otherwise, if they accept fiat, you're still going to get rid of your fiat first because it's inflationary. This is and amazing. when you have circular yeah. economy. You know, I'm really looking forward to a deflationary economy. I, I, I also talked to the author of, oh, wow, uh, yeah. of Jeff, uh, you know, Jeff Booth, the author of Price of Tomorrow. It's, it's an amazing book. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, please do. Uh, maybe oh, we can you know, continue our talk uh, next time. Uh, we'll be a really enjoyed our talk. Uh, so uh, what's the, uh, any, any final thoughts or, or uh, words of wisdom uh, besides, you know, stacking sets, auto-accumulate or auto dca Um the the main thoughts is that you know this is a financial revolution and we want to do this right and start it off on the right basis and that right basis is one where we understand that all of us are servants to the future we there's a whole new generation of people out there um generation z um, millennials who um have been um, sold short by the existing um, financial world. And there's an opportunity to give them access to this new, new financial future. 
And so we have to do everything possible to do that and set them off with the right footing. And the way you do that is simple. You focus them on the only currency, cryptocurrency that really is worth talking about from a reliability, technical maturity community point of view, Bitcoin. You don't confuse them with trading. You focus them on investing um, because we know that the past was about short-term speculation. The future is about long-term certainty and stability uh, through mathematics and game theory and just understanding people. And then finally, you just try to educate, educate and educate. And so those are my past final words. You can hear me going on about this on Twitter. I'm OB on Twitter. Luckily, I had a very, I was very early into Twitter. So I just have OB as my Twitter. And obviously, on CoinFloor, um, our website, coinfloor.co.uk. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So OB is simple. OBI on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, CoinFloor. Uh, and the, the website or the platform, is it coinflow.co.uk slash hodl? Yes. Yeah. Great. We have coinflow.com as well. It all redirects to the same place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to put those in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, Obi. Hope we can. Thank you very much. Keep in the future and talk to you soon. See you later. See Bye. You later. Bye. Bye. Have a good, great day. Well, if you're, if you're in st st stacking sets by now, you should be out to DCA is the key to the future out to accumulating saving because Bitcoin is a saving technology. So let me know what you think about this awesome, fascinating conversation I've had with Obi Nervoso, the co-founder and CEO of CoinFloor. Uh, we talked about so many topics, which is, I have to digest it first myself, but let me know your questions, your feedback. And, um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you back and, uh, uh make sure you follow, uh, Obi on Twitter and going to put those in the show notes, all the information and make sure you, you check out CoinFloor, the auto DCA huddle, um, function and yeah, thanks so much for support and for listening. Hope you've had some fun. See you soon.